are in week four of Exponential. If you've got your Bibles, open up to the book of 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 17. We're going to talk about Elijah in just a few minutes. But before I get into the message, um, you may have noticed that there's somebody missing from right here, uh, which is why they were running back and forth. You know, Nathan Moore makes it look so easy every week. All right, the things that he does. If, if, if this is your first time, Nathan is our worship leader. Uh, he's also our student pastor. Um, Nathan's mom has been, um, has been going downhill uh, just physically. Um, you know, she's battled cancer back and forth and, you know, battled a lot of things. And so, um, it, frankly, it's been a downhill battle for the last several weeks. And uh, I texted Nathan this morning. She's still hanging on, but they, they really do believe that she's probably in her last couple of days, maybe even a few hours. So Nathan took his family down to visit uh, with you know, his six kids and his wife down to, to visit with his mom and, uh, and dad and sister and uh, you know, for the kids to spend just a little bit of time with her. So pray for them. Pray for them this week. It's, it's, it's been difficult. Nathan is an amazing leader, and one of the marks of an amazing leader is you have a team behind you who can pick up the slack when you're gone, but what any team knows is when your leader's out, it's hard, you know, it's, it's hard, it's hard when any team member's out, but it's very difficult even when, you're, when your leader is out, so, you know, yesterday, he, I got a call Friday, I said, man, I really think I need to go down, um, here's what's happening Sunday, and by the way, Saturday, you know, we had this, uh, our, our, he's our student pastor, and our kids went to play paintball yesterday, which my son was one that went. And so Nathan said, um, since I'm not going to be there, can you drive and take kids? <laughs> sure, I love paintball, but I am hurting so bad. Like, it was so much fun. I've got my coffee this morning. Hope you guys are well caffeinated, all right? I got my coffee up here just in case I need it. Uh, but listen, we hope that church every single week is like a double espresso shot in the face. Like, we, we, we do lively, fast, contemporary, modern music, and then sometimes we slow it down. But we do that because we believe that we serve a God who's got all kinds of dimensions, that, that we are going to sing and we're going to dance like David did as he came in, you know, uh, as he came into Jerusalem in front of the ark. We're going to do that when we get to heaven. We're going to be singing praises. We're going to be clapping hands. We're going to be moving around. We are a church that wants to praise and worship God. So we want it to be a great weekend. And we are a church that I believe, that we believe, God wants to do something exponential through because he is an exponential God. As I taught you in the very first week, God, we think uh, in, in, in terms of addition. Let's add a few people, right? God thinks in terms of multiplication. He wants to multiply our church. I believe he wants to multiply your life. He wants to multiply your, the ministry that you have, uh, the, the quality of your marriage, the relationship that you have with your kids. If you have a business or you work at a business, which most of you do, God wants to multiply your influence there. God is a multiplying God. That's what the Exponential Series is all about. Now, I'm just be, gonna be upfront. We don't talk about money a whole lot at the church at Lake Forest, we don't typically pass an offering plate. We've got boxes front and back. I don't even mention it every week. You know, we might have a slide on the screen or something, you know, in, a, in, a, in our worship guide, that, that sort of thing. But part of this series, just out front and open, because I know some of you are new, you came to see a baptism. We're going to talk a little bit about money this morning. And every, you know, every week, a little bit for the last four weeks, we've talked a little bit about money. Because at the end of the morning this morning, we're going to take up an offering. Unlike we have done for the last couple of years that I've been here, we're going we're gonna to pass some baskets. There were envelopes on your seats. I'm going to talk about that at the end again. But we are trusting that God wants to do something exponential here. And as a church family, listen, as a church family, if you're new, you're off the hook. You don't have to give a thing. We don't expect you to. But as a church family, what we've been talking about for the last four weeks is us investing in our church, us investing in the ministry here so that we have an amazing experience, an amazing environment to invite people into. And then not only are we going to invest, then we, we got to do the second part, which is invite. Go out and invite people to join us, invite people to join our family, invite people into the kingdom with us. That's why every single week there are invite cards. You can pick them up at the cafe. Sometimes they're on the table, but I don't see them this morning. But we've got invite cards. They say no perfect people allowed. It looks like that little card in front of you has our service time and directions and that sort of thing on it. We invite people to church, and we are investing. Right now, we're investing in our future because God wants to do something 
exponential. And that's where we pick up in 1 Kings uh, chapter 17. We're going to be in verse 7. I'm going to tell you on the front end, we're going to be reading about this man named Elijah, who is a prophet. And we're going to read uh, verse 7 through 24. I want to read you the whole story this morning because it's an amazing story. And it's one of those that may not be as familiar to all of you. Some of you, you know, even if you've been in church most of your life, you may not have read this story. You may not have heard this story. But some of you, you're like, yeah, I've been there, done that, right? So because it's, it's one that's not quite as familiar as you know, turning water into wine maybe or, or you know, feeding with, with loaves and fishes instead of paraphrasing, instead of telling you the story. I want to read it this morning. So, 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 7, it says, But after a while the brook dried up, for there was no rainfall anywhere in the land. Now, here's the, the, the pre-story, right, the prequel. God has told Elijah, tell the king Ahab, I'm going to get to him in a second, tell the king there's going to be a drought. Until I say it's going to rain, there will be no rain. And so Elijah has been surviving off of ravens who have been bringing him food as he sits beside this brook, right? God has been taking care of Elijah. But in verse 7, it says the brook dried up. After a while, eventually that went away. So now God's going to continue meeting Elijah's needs. So verse 8, it says, Then the Lord said to Elijah, Go and live in the village of Zarephath near the city of Sidon. I have instructed a widow there to feed you. So he went to Zarephath. As he arrived at the gates of the village, he saw a widow gathering sticks, and he asked her, Would you please bring me a little water in a cup? And as she was going to get it, he called her, Oh, and hey, by the way, hang on, hang on. On your way back with the water, which, by the way, was just very, that was customary. If anybody, back then, if anybody asked you for water, you just gave it to them, right? Somebody, you want to be a good host, Sometimes people might ask for a little bit more, but you didn't necessarily have to give them more. So, so he, he pauses and he says, um, and he called to her, verse 11, bring me a bite of bread too. On your way back with that water, man, I'm hungry too. Could you bring me some bread? Verse 12, but she said, I swear by the Lord your God that I don't have a single piece of bread in the house and I have only a handful of flour left in the jar and a little cooking oil in the bottom of the jug. I was just gathering a few sticks to cook this last meal, and then my son and I will die. But Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go ahead and do just what you've said, but make a little bread for me first. Then use what's left to prepare a meal for yourself and your son, for this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. There will always be flour and olive oil left in your containers until the time when the Lord sends rain and the crops grow again. In other words, I serve an exponential God. And God is about to do something exponential in your life. I just need you to trust me. I need you to obey. I need you to do what I'm asking you to do. And listen, I'm promising you that God is going to do something for you and for your son. You won't run out of food until there's food growing again in your backyard. That's what Elijah is saying to this widow. Verse 15, so she did as Elijah said. And she and Elijah and her family continued to eat for many days. There was also enough flour and olive oil left in the containers, just as the Lord had promised through Elijah. Some time later, the widow's son became sick. He grew worse and worse, and finally, he died. Then she said to Elijah, O oh man of God, what have you done to me? Have you come here to point out my sins and kill my son? But Elijah replied, give me your son. And he took the child's body from her arms, carried him up the stairs to the room where he was staying, and laid the body on his bed. Then Elijah cried out to the Lord, O oh Lord my God, why have you brought tragedy to this widow who has opened her home to me, causing her son to die? And he stretched himself out over the child three times and cried out to the Lord, O oh Lord my God, please let this child's life return to him. Then the Lord heard Elijah's prayer, and the life of the child returned, and he revived. Then Elijah brought him down from the upper room and gave him to his mother. Look, he said, your son is alive. Then the woman told Elijah, now I know for sure that you are a man of God and that the Lord truly speaks through you. This is a miracle. It's miracle on miracle on miracle. What God is doing in the life of Elijah, in the life of this widow, and in the life of her son can only be described as miraculous. 
that God is doing something so unexpected and so just un, really unfamiliar to us. I want to dig into the story because this is, this is an unlikely story. This is not likely to happen to any of us, right? And, and, and you're not likely to see anything like this in your lives. And I think even for Elijah and for this widow and for her son, this is an unlikely set of events. They could have never guessed what was going to happen before it happened. And yet it did, because God likes to do those sorts of things. As a matter of fact, God will often take us to unlikely places and use unlikely people and, and follow unlikely strategies to come to an unlikely outcome. God did it then. I believe that God is still doing it now. And if you're taking notes, I just gave you the four blanks that are in your notes. We'll get to that in just a second. So let me back up just a second. So Elijah, is, is, he's experiencing this just unlikely, uh, extravagant outpouring of God's care for him while, frankly, everything else is suffering. So why are all these other people suffering? Why is there a drought? One name, King Ahab. Ahab is, is the king of, of, of God's chosen people, the king of the Israelites. And, and when God set them apart, when he said, I'll be your people, or I'll be your God, you'll be my people, he gave them some rules to live by. And one of the rules that he gave them was, listen, don't intermarry. Don't marry the Gentiles. You're, 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 there's a lot of you, right? And I know for us it's kind of weird to marry your cousins, but there was a lot of them, and they were supposed to marry their cousins, basically. They're, you know, their second or third cousin 14 times removed, whatever that looked like, Right? But you're my people. I want you to marry my people. Don't go marrying the Gentiles. And here's the reason why. When you do that, they worship other gods. And you're going to be inviting other gods into your life. And listen, you're my people and I'm your God. I'm just trying to protect you. I'm not trying to control your life. But I want you to understand this is a special relationship that we have. What did King Ahab do? He married a woman named Jezebel. You've probably all heard that name before. Even today, even today, when you look at somebody and you say, you Jezebel, you know what that means, right? That's King Ahab's wife. She was a Gentile. She was not one of God's chosen people. As a matter of fact, she worshiped a God named Baal. And when Ahab married her, this, this princess of the Sidonians, and brought her into the kingdom, brought her into the palace, she instituted worship of other gods. And Ahab became this evil, vile king leading the people of God, the chosen people of God, to stop worshiping God and start worshiping other gods. And Ahab has this, he has this, um, this reputation. It's actually from the chapter before, 1 Kings 16, 33. It says that Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than did all the kings of Israel before him. How would you like to have that reputation? He did more to provoke the anger of the Lord than did all the kings before him. Ahab was not a good guy. And because of what Ahab was doing, because of the way that he was leading God's people away from God, God sent a famine. He sent, he sent, uh, he calls it to stop raining. The crops stopped growing. Yes, that means that livestock starts to die. That means that people don't have food. That means that without a doubt, there is, there is suffering in the land. There are people like this widow in our story who don't have enough to eat. They don't know where their provision is coming from. They have not turned to God. They've turned their back on God. And when God takes his hand of blessing, his hand of provision away, this is what, this is what happens, right? God is not cursing them and saying, you will die what God is simply saying is, listen, if you want it your way, fine, hands off. Have it your way. I won't do anything to stop you. And where they find themselves is, the, is in the middle of suffering. Because if God takes his hand off of our lives, that's what we have left. We simply have suffering. The, the world is in the shape that it's in because we want it this way. Your life, if you're, if, if you're in the middle of, 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 of suffering, now I'm not saying that Everything that you do happens to you because of choices that you make. Sometimes it's choices that other people make, right? But when you put all of that together, the reason that our world is in the shape that it's in is because we want to do what we want to do, and the rest of the world be damned. We want to do what we want to do, and when I do what I want to do, and you do what you want to do, and none of us do what God wants us to do, we end up in the shape that we're in. And that's where Elijah walks in, in 1 Kings chapter 17. 
God sent this prophet to an unlikely place where he would find an unlikely person. He would require her to do an unlikely thing, an unlikely act. And then there's this unlikely result. So let's dig into the story. Number one, if you're taking notes, this is an unlikely place. It's an unlikely place. God sends Elijah to an unlikely place. If you'll notice back in verse 1, it says that he went to this um, Zarephath next to the city of Sidon. This is Jezebel's hometown. This is where she's from. Jezebel's been hunting Elijah. Ahab and Jezebel have been trying to find him, to kill him. And what God says is, you know, I was thinking, I've been like taking care of you beside this brook. You've been having this little, you know, waterfront vacation spot. These birds have been, you know, bringing you food. And, you know, they've been like, you know, your, 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 your servants, your butlers. You haven't had to cook a thing. They wait on your hand and foot, right? The birds just show up. And, and you're, you've got this, I'm just going to drop that brook. And I want you to go into the belly of the beast. I want you to go to the place where the woman who wants to kill you, where all of her family live. I want you to go there. And live for a while. Just go live there. This is an unlikely place. This is the, it's the, it's the least likely place that probably Elijah could think of that he would ever want to go do ministry or that God would ever even call him to go do any kind of ministry. This is not where he wants to go. This this Zarephath next to the city of Sidon. Listen. We often find ourselves in unlikely places. I believe that the most unlikely place is normally where we are right now. Where we are right now. Because where you are right now, it's very easy to say, if only I were there, I would do whatever it is that, that God was asking me to do. If, if only things were different, if only, if, only I were, if only I were over there, I could do X, Y, Z. I would have the money, I would have the time, I would have whatever it is, but, but I'm here and while I'm here, it would be so much better if I was over there. But, but this is where my life is today. I'm, I'm, I'm here. We think if we were somewhere else, anywhere else, but here, the things would be better. If only I was there. If, if I were in a better job, if I were in a better job, I could do more. I could, I could spend, I, if I made more, I could give more, right? We think uh, if, I was, if I was married, I could do more ministry. I could minister to married people and be a part of the student ministry. Then we think, well, if I was just single, then maybe God could use me more, right? If I, was, if I, were, uh, if I were not in school, like I'm, I'm, just, I'm, I'm so busy with college, I'm so busy with school. If, if I were just, when I graduate, God, if I were just there instead of here, and then some of us are thinking, well, if I could just finish, if I could just go to school, you know, God could use me more because I would have more knowledge. We often think if I could just go there instead of here, Maybe I could accomplish something in life. But listen, we only ever have here. We only ever have here. Because when you get there, you know where there is, it's here again. We only ever have here. What we have to learn to do is obey God in the here and now. Listen, your life is never going to be perfect. Thank God we are a church where no perfect people are allowed. If you're waiting for the perfect opportunity to serve God, I could say it's never going to come, but that would be a lie. I would say it's right here, right now. The perfect time to serve God is right here, right now. Elijah is in the middle of these crazy circumstances. This widow is in the middle of these crazy circumstances. And he's here. He's standing in the middle of this town that's like Jezebel's hometown, talking to a widow who's about to go, you know, just curl up and die. And it's right here, right now, this is the time to minister. Right here, right now, this is the time to obey. Right here, right now, this is the time to do what God is asking me to do. Right here, right now, God has given everyone in this room at least four things. At least four things that we can give back to God that we can use to serve the kingdom. Your time, your talent, your treasure, and your tongue, the things that you say. We all have time. Some of us may have more time than, than others, or at least we feel like we have more time than others, or, or you may think somebody else has got more time. You don't have any time. This doesn't matter how much time you have. However much time you have to serve, that's what God is expecting us to do, to be obedient with some of our time. Your talent, yes, we all have different talents. You don't have to be able to, you know, to play a keyboard or push a button or, or strum a guitar or sing. You don't have to have those kinds of talents. Whatever kind of talent you have, you can use that talent right here, right now to serve God, your treasure. You might think, I just don't have enough. If I only, you know, like, if I only had you know, more money, if I only had a better job, I could, I could give more. Listen, whatever treasure you have, we give. 
It's an amazing thing the way that, the way that God designed the church and that we all give this thing called a tithe, this 10%. He didn't invite you know, five or 10 millionaires to come fund every church, that they're just going to give, you know, they're, they're going to give all that they've got. No, that's not how God designed it. He designed it so that we could all be a part of his plan, so that all of us, whether you are a poor widow or you are a wealthy millionaire, we all play the same part in God's kingdom. And then our tongue. Listen, there's so much that we can do with this thing. There's so much. And, you know, now our tongue, I think most likely it's, I should probably I put our thumbs instead of our tongues. <laughs> because all of you, if you're on social media, you have this platform where your tongue comes out through your thumbs or maybe your fingers if you're one of those people, right? But it comes out on, on Facebook, on Instagram, on Snapchat, on whatever. But, but the things that we say, the things that we, that we thumb to other people, we use our tongues, we use our thumbs, it can be used to serve God. Right here, right now. I can't tell you how many times in the last week I see a comment, and I like type it out, and I just want to set somebody straight, and I think, no, I need to delete, delete, delete. All right, be kind, be kind. It's July 4th weekend. Uh, my pastor, Pastor uh, David Hughes, I noticed that he tweeted something out because he's doing a, you know, a July 4th message, and uh, he, he made a comment about politics. And you have to understand, he is the kindest pastor you've ever met. He will look you straight in the face and tell you the truth, and then make you melt with his kindness as he does it. But one of the things that he reminded me and he reminded everybody this weekend was, you know, in James chapter 1, it talks about how we control our tongue. And he just said, listen, even in politics... Be kind, right? There's, there's the opportunity to use our tongues and our thumbs and our talent and our treasure and our time to be kind, to, to be life-changing, to be world changers. You only have a certain amount, right? God gives all of us different amounts. We talked about, we talked about the talents you know, in the last couple of weeks. God gives us all a certain amount, and what God asks us to do and expects from us, just like he did from this widow, it's to simply invest it back into the kingdom to obey him. <clears throat> number two. So number one was an unlikely place. Number two is an unlikely person. An unlikely person. God not only sent Elijah to an unlikely place, he also sent him to this unlikely person, this, this widow. Um, it says in, in uh, verse... 10, as he went to Zarephath, as he arrived at the gates of the village, he saw a widow gathering sticks. Would you please bring me a cup of water, right? And then um, we find out down in verse, I lost myself, verse 12, when he asked her for bread, she says, I swear by the Lord your God that I don't have a single piece of bread in the house. I only have a handful of flour left in a jar and a little cooking oil in the bottom of the jug. I was just gathering some sticks to cook this last meal, and then my son and I will die. Right? Here's what we know about this woman. She is a widow. She is a single mother. She is a Gentile. She's limited by her ethnicity. She's limited by her gender because as a, as a, as a single mother, widow, female, like she, she would basically have been treated as property, Right? She's limited in so many ways, and, and she's, remember, she's not an Israelite. Like, God did not send Elijah to his chosen people here. God sent Elijah to where Jezebel was from. God sent Elijah out of the land flowing with milk and honey and into the land of cheeseburgers and pigskins, right, to where the Gentiles live, except all the crops and animals have died, so nobody has any cheeseburgers anymore. But that's, that, that's where he is. And his interaction with her, and more importantly, her interaction with God, would have been limited by where she grew up, by who she was, by what her past was. We don't know how her husband died. We don't know how that happened, but she's a widow. She's a single mom. She's got a son. We don't know exactly how old he is, but, but we know that they're going to die. She's the poorest of the poor. She has nothing. She is the most unlikely candidate. Her community has been ravaged by this, this drought, this famine in the land. She's a non-believing widow in a dry land with no food and no drink who's ready to curl up and die. And listen to this. And she's God's top 
choice to provide for Elijah. We would look at her and think, she has nothing. She can't provide for anybody. She's weak, right? She's weak-willed. She's ready to curl up and die. I mean, she's like, she's not even fighting for it. She's not even going out and trying to, she's just picking up some sticks so she can go home and die. She's the least likely candidate to provide for the man of God, to provide for the people of God. She's not even one of us. She doesn't look like us. She doesn't dress like us. Maybe she's got some tattoos. I don't know. She just looks different, right? Thank God for all of our people with tattoos leading worship on stage, right? She, she must be unusable by God. She must, because she has been thrown away by everybody else and ignored by everybody else in her life, God must ignore her. No, she's the prime candidate to be used to provide for Elijah. God does unlikely things through unlikely people. And if you're sitting here this morning, listen, if you're sitting here this morning and you are the most attractive, buffest, wealthiest, best parent, like, like you know, Pinterest, Instagram ready, whatever, God can still use you. It's okay. God can still use you. But for the rest of us, the most unlikely people are often the most likely people that God uses. I'm looking at a room full of unlikely people, okay? I mean, come on. We're the church at Lake Forest. I'm like the king of the unlikely people. I'm the son of an alcoholic drug addict who tried to kill me before I was a year old. Unlikely. I'm the person who in high school slept through all of his classes, but somehow was still voted most likely to succeed because I'm brilliant, go to college on a full scholarship and dropped out my freshman year. Wow, you make some great choices, Pastor Chris. Unlikely. I'm the guy who was serving at mega churches of 10,000 plus that the church at Lake Forest called to come be the pastor who's never led a church before. I was in, in children's ministry and ran a school. I'm the least likely candidate for this job. I'm the least likely person to lead this church, and yet I'm here. You're here. I know some of your stories. I don't know all of your stories, but I know some of you. And I know some of you who, who lead groups and who lead worship and, and, and who, who invite people to church all the time. And you know and I know that because of your past, you're not a very likely person for God to choose as a candidate to represent the kingdom. But the last time I checked my Bible, it said that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That, that, that in our sins, we are all separated from God, that we're all alike in one way. We're all enemies of the kingdom until we trust Jesus as our Savior. That's why he came to save us from who we were. It's okay to not be okay, but it's not okay to stay that way. And God loves you too much. If you're looking at yourself and where you are right now and you're saying, I'm in an unlikely place and I'm definitely an unlikely person and I don't even know if I believe in this whole God thing. Listen, you have a God who loves you too much to leave you that way. That's why he sent his son Jesus because he calls unlikely people. He used 12 guys who couldn't finish VBS, who failed, flunked out of Bible school. A couple of them were fishermen. I'm not even sure if they were literate. And they changed the world. Literally, one guy was a tax collector, the most hated, least likely. He couldn't even go to heaven when he died, according to the Jews. That he literally, like, like there were sinners, notorious sinners, like murderers and rapists, and then there were tax collectors. And on top of that, he should have been serving in the temple. He was a Levite. He was like God's like chosen, chosen. And he turned his back on God. He collected taxes for Rome. He was hated by everybody. And when Jesus walked by Levi's tax collector's booth and he looked at, he looked at the man that we call Matthew, that the book of Matthew is, is about and written by, he looked at Matthew and said, get up and follow me. You're the most unlikely person in the most unlikely place doing the most unlikely, ungodly thing, cheating people out of their money. Come follow me. Listen, if that's you, what Jesus is saying to you this morning is I don't care how, how, how unlikely, I want to do something exponential with your life. I want to do something exponential through you because I use unlikely people and I go to unlikely places to find them. And listen, Walls, Mississippi, 
It may be the most unlikely place on earth for God to show up, but I believe that he is here. He is here this morning calling us to him. It says in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 1.27, it won't be on the screen, just that God uses foolish things to confound the wise. Sometimes he uses us. God, God uses the foolishness of preaching, it says, to confound the wisdom of the world because even foolishness from God, which is not foolishness, but even the things that the world think is foolish that comes from God is greater than any wisdom of man. God uses unlikely things. It's in our weakness that he is made strong. Um, we are, we, we, we're all that God has. Listen, that sounds weird, right? Couldn't God do better than us? We're all that God has. But he flipped that around. Listen, we are all that God has. God uses us to show off. God uses us in our weakness. We are made, he makes us strong in our weakness. He's not looking for whatever ability that you think you need. He's simply looking for you to be available for him to use you. An unlikely person in an unlikely place. Number three, an unlikely strategy. What we see in this story is that God uses an unlikely strategy to, to eventually get to an unlikely outcome. Elijah makes this strange request, right? So he says in, in 1 Kings uh, verse 11, he says, can I get a drink of water? And he says, and bring me a bite of bread. Bring me a bite of bread too. He makes this, this strange request. And then we find out in the very next verse, in verse 12, that, that the widow says, I don't have any bread, right? I, I've only got... Well, I don't have a single piece of bread. I don't have any bread. All I've got is like a jar with a little bit of oil, and i got another jar with a little bit of flour. I'm going to go home, cook this meal, and we're both going to curl up and die, like me and my son. That, that's, I, I, don't, I don't have any bread. Listen, what she saw was only just you know, a handful of, of ingredients, and, and the way that she responded to the question is often the way that, that we respond to the requests of God or the expectations of God or when somebody asks us to do something, we often respond the way that, the way that, that she responds. I can't. I don't have it. She focused on what she didn't have instead of focusing on what she did have. See, God doesn't call you and ask you to do something with what you don't have. God calls you and asks you to do something with what you do have. What do you have? You have time, you have talents, you have treasure. may not be as much as somebody else, but you have that, and you have a tongue. God, God calls us to use those things. And what, what she doesn't realize is what she sees in verse 12 is just this handful of ingredients. She's, just, she's got a little bit of flour and a little bit of oil. What she doesn't understand is that little handful of ingredients, that's the ingredients, that's all, that's all the ingredients that God needed to perform a miracle in her life. When God asks you for what you have, and you respond with what you don't have. God said, wait, 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 no, no, no. It's okay. I know you don't have that. That's not what I'm, I'm not, I'm not asking you to give me what you don't have. Listen, I've just, got a, I've, just, I've, just got a little, I've just got a little bit of flour, a little bit of oil. This is all I have. God says, okay. I'm going to perform an amazing miracle with what little bit you have. It's an un." likely strategy. He asks for a piece of bread. She says, I don't have any. All I've got is this. And listen to what he says to her. In verse 13, I think I'm skipping a few slides, but that's all right. In verse 13, he says, it's okay. Don't be afraid. I love Elijah's response here. Don't be afraid. He, he understands that her response is a response of fear. Often God says to us, don't be afraid. When we look at what we have, we, I, just, I, just, I, have a little, I don't have anything on my bank account. I don't, I don't have any talent to give. God did not give me a voice to sing. I, I, you know, I, I'm not even a good parent. My, you know, I'm divorced. My kids don't even live with me. They're, they're somewhere else. There's no way I could serve in student ministry or children's ministry. I've not, I, I've, whatever. I don't, have, I don't have. All I have is just this little bitty bit. When we respond to God out of that little bitty bit, oftentimes we're responding out of fear. Listen, it's not the fear, really, of giving what we have. Because, I mean, come on, let's be realistic. For this widow, she's about to die anyway. What does it matter whether she gets a full meal, like one biscuit, or a half a meal, half a biscuit? She's still going to die, right? The fear for her really isn't, and for us, it isn't about giving what we have. 
The fear that we have is a fear of missing out. We're afraid that if we give what we have, we won't have what we don't have, what we really want that we wished we had. We're afraid that we won't be able to get that. We won't be able to trade what we have today for what we really want tomorrow. We're afraid that we're going to miss out on something. If I give this little bit, then I don't have anything left for me. If I give this little bit, because I've, I've paid all these bills and I've done all this, and God, this is what I have left. I just have some leftovers. If I give this little bit of leftovers, they don't have anything left for me. And so the, fir- the first step of this unlikely strategy when Elijah responds is he says, don't be afraid But then he says in verse 13, but first, he says, go ahead and do what you're planning to do, but go make me some bread first, and then take what you have left over and make your meal for you and your son. See, here's the unlikely strategy that God uses over and over and over and over and over and over again. It's this idea of first fruits. See, the way that we live our lives and the reason that we're huddled in fear and we're looking at what little bit we have is, is the, re- the way that we naturally live our lives from one day to the next as we, as we live in sin and we're struggling to understand what it is that God wants for our lives. The way that we naturally live is we want things. We go, we work hard, we make money, we pay the bills that we have to pay, we have some things in our lives that bring us pleasure, that we have fun. There's nothing wrong with having fun and spending money on the things that have fun, that we have fun with. So we pay our bills, those things that are necessary, and then we spend our money on the things that are that 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 are that are special, that we enjoy doing, that we want to do. And then with whatever we have left, we might save some, we might give some to God. What we end up walking into church with, what we end up going through life with is our sloppy seconds, our leftovers. And that's what we offer to God. I only have a little bit left, and God, if you take it, then I don't have anything to save. I only have a little bit left, and if, and if I give this to God, then, then I don't have anything left to prepare for the future, to, to pay for a, a wedding for my child, or to pay for college, or whatever it is, this, these future things. I'm trying to save up a you know a thousand dollar emergency fund, and God, if I if I give my last ten dollars to you, I'm not going to have anything to put in that emergency fund. And you know that the car or the air conditioner can blow up any time. And we get we we get caught up in being afraid. And what Elijah says to this widow is, "Don't be afraid. Obey God first. Do what I'm asking you to do." First, listen, this is God's plan for our lives. Matthew 6, says, seek first the kingdom of God. It's about putting God's priorities in order above our priorities. What God is asking this widow to do is simply believe. He tells her, this is what's going to happen. You do this first, then make your meal, and here's, what's, here's what God's going to do for you. You're never going to run out. Because my God can supply all your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. It's never going to run out. You... Live your life according to what God's priorities are. Seek first the kingdom of God. We think, when I have something, then I will give it. And what God says is, is no. That, that, that's, that's the opposite. You give, and then I'm going to bless you. You take the first fruits. That's the tithe. That's the, that's the first 10%. Give your, give your time first, and listen, you're going to have more time later. Give your, give your talent first, or you won't have any talent to give later. Give your tongue first, not only when somebody is nice to you, but you be nice to them. Give your treasure first, or the reality is you won't give your treasure later. Tithing is about the first 10%. Often we have this, this scarcity mentality where we're afraid to give. Malachi 3.10 says, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you won't have room for it. Listen, God invites all of us to be a part of his kingdom plan. His kingdom plan for us is that we give 10% off the top, that we tithe from the beginning, that we put him first. It is an unlikely strategy. You look at your bills. You look at the money coming in, the money going out. You look at your budget, and you think there's no way. On this 90%, I cannot possibly do what it is that I need to do to live my life. I I can't do that. I'm telling you, as a person who's lived it and done it, 
It works. Yes, you can. Listen, I had to learn to tithe early, and God had to know that he could trust me early for God to bless me the way that he's blessed me today. So fortunately, I've got amazing parents. And yes, that dad that I mentioned, for those of you who don't know, is sitting on the front row, and he was the pastor of this church for 26 years, an unlikely person in an unlikely place. But my parents taught me to tithe at a very young age. And so when I got my first $3 allowance, you know what I did? I tithe 30 cents of it, right? And you think like 30 cents, that's nothing. It's three bucks. Listen, to like a, a six or seven-year-old, that's a lot of money, right? But you think, you know, all I've got is this $10. I, I can't give much. It, a dollar's not much, but a dollar's a dollar. It's not about the much. It's what God can do with whatever you put in his hands, and so when I trusted God with $3, then, then when I got my first job and I was working at, listen, you talk about unlikely. And I've traveled around the country and shared this story with a couple of other people, like, like this part of my story, especially I lived in Washington, D.C. for a summer, and they love to hear this because this is this Mississippi boy who sounds different than everybody else and says, yes, ma'am, and yes, sir, and thank you, and please, and nobody else said that, right? I stuck out like a sore thumb. But then I would tell people, yeah, so in high school, I worked at Piggly Wiggly on Bullfrog Corner and graduated from Horn Lake High School. Like, what planet are you from, dude? Unlikely place. But listen, when I worked at Piggly Wiggly, I got that first, you know, that first working job. What did I do with the money that I got paid? You know, the, the $100 or whatever it was that I made on Friday, I tithed. When I started in children's ministry, I made a whopping $100 a week, and I tithed that $10. Like, that's God sees how much he can trust you as he, as he gives you what he... Listen, everything that we have, we know everything good comes from our Father. Everything that we have comes from God. And when God sees that he can trust you with a little, he begins to give you more. When God sees that you will tie the little, he'll give you more. Case in point, so we moved, and I've shared this story before, we moved to Decatur, Alabama. We moved you know, a few hours away. It was our first time living away from home. We had one child and one on the way. And I thought, like most people do, just in case I'll get a credit card. Like, isn't that what, what we're taught? It's for emergencies only. I'll just get that emergency credit card because we're moving across state lines. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know where we're going to live and all that stuff. I'm, I'm doing what God wants me to do, so he's going to take, take care of me with the credit card. And then that emergency card became just swipe it for whatever. Built up debt. I suddenly can't pay my bills on the 90%. I need that extra 10%. I stopped tithing. More debt. I hid it from my wife, more debt. You know, it didn't get crazy out of control where I was like hundreds of thousands in debt, thank God, but I was thousands in debt, and somebody called me on it. My pastor called me on it. You've stopped. I was a, I was a kid's pastor at a church and quit tithing. And I thought, like, the world thinks this way. I'm looking at my bills. Here's what's going out every month. Here's now this credit card debt, this credit card bill. I will never be able to pay this off on only 90%. And then I did what every good man does. I put my wife in charge of the money. <laughs> right? We immediately, like that week, started tithing 10% again. And within just a few short months, all the debt was paid off. Because what I remembered was, and I told you this last week, every time you give, especially every time you tithe, what you are proclaiming is that God owns it all anyway. And because God owns it all anyway, God, you're in charge. I'm going to spend it the way that you want me to spend it instead of the way that I want to spend it. Not just that 10%, but all 100% belongs to God anyway. So when I give my 10, what I'm saying is, God, I'm giving you what belongs to you, and I'm proclaiming that you own the rest of it, so help me lead my life the way that I should lead my life and make the financial choices that I need to make. And it's amazing. It's a miracle what God can do. It is an unlikely strategy, but it happens. And he knew that if he could trust me then, he could trust me now, and God continues to bless us, and we continue to tithe. And I know there are lots of other people around the church who would say the same thing. It's an unlikely strategy. And it led to, number four, an unlikely outcome. An unlikely outcome. It says in verse 15 and 16, there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. The jar of flour was not used up. The jug of oil did not run dry. Because she followed God. Listen, she's a Gentile. She is not someone who's been taught her whole life to, to trust the God of the Jews, to, to tithe. She, she's never been taught that. And, and by the way, Elijah didn't show up and say, well, if you'll just tithe, do this. No, he, he used language that she could understand. 
He said, just give me a piece of bread. Just obey God in this small way. Give me a piece of bread. Right? Jesus says in the New Testament, uh, d- decide in your heart what you want to give because God loves a cheerful, cheerful giver. Right? So she gives and God blesses. The woman doesn't run out. God does a miracle in her life because she decides to follow what God has taught her to do. Listen, we can experience miracles at the Church of Lake Forest. You can experience miracles in your life when you begin to do what God asks you to do. It's an unlikely outcome. What she didn't know when she gave Elijah that piece of bread is that her miracle was going to need a miracle. See, she thought that her miracle was that the oil and flour didn't run out. But that wasn't her miracle. Her miracle was that her son came back to life. Okay? Her miracle, her like unbelief, this, this in a mil- like you might be able to explain somehow the flour, you know, like, uh, you know, maybe somebody showed up and gave her a little extra flour every day. Maybe, you know, the, the magical little, you know, oil fairies came in and poured something. I don't know. You could, you, maybe you could explain that away, that, that neighbors decided to be kind. And so that's how she never ran out. Like, that's not really a miracle. Like, we know it's just the Bible kind of makes miracles up. But it, it's possible that, that just her neighbors helped her out, right? Her son came back to life. You can't explain that one away. That one is her miracle. And what she didn't know was that her miracle, her son coming back to life, needed a miracle. She was saving the life of the prophet who would save the life of her son. When she decided to obey God in an unlikely place, an unlikely person following a completely unlikely strategy, she's saving the man who's going to save her son. Her miracle needed the miracle. Listen, when we begin to obey God, a lot of times we don't see a lot happening, right? We talked about that in the very first week with the tent and Abraham and, you know, all that stuff. A lot of times we don't see what God's doing behind the scenes. We don't understand his whole plan. We don't, we don't get the way that God works in us and through us, that he's growing these roots before we ever even see the fruit, This woman doesn't know that her son is going to need someone who can raise the dead. But by obeying God, she keeps Elijah alive so that he can give life to her son. How often does a church help you? Right? When when, when you give to the church, when you give to the church at Lake Forest, like how often are you blessed by seeing a child baptized on stage, maybe even your own child? How often can, can a marriage be saved because there are people around you loving on you? I mean, I know a lot of times it's very easy to focus on the bad things that happen about the marriages that end and about the, the kids who go astray. But listen, you, those are easy to count. But it's next to impossible to count all the positive things that happen. The way that God works in our life day after day, moment after moment, the breath that we get to breathe comes from God. God has blessed this church and people through this church so much in so many seasons because over the course of time, people have decided, I'm going to do it God's way. In an unlikely place, I'm an unlikely person following this unlikely strategy, and we want to see unlikely outcomes. I am believing God for a miracle. I shared this, I think, in the very first week, and I definitely expounded on it in week two. I'm trusting God for a miracle. But our miracle needs a miracle. The miracle that I'm trusting God for is that that in in my generation, before I retire, that this church reaches 6,000 people. That is my prayer. I showed you in, in one of those weeks how, like, really without even God's help, we can get there which means that God can do exponentially more than all I could ask or imagine. God can do exponentially more in this church than all we could ask or imagine. But I'm telling you, I'm telling you, God doesn't need us to perform the miracle, but God uses us to perform the miracle. God used this widow to save the prophet, to save her son. God uses us, the unlikely people in an unlikely place following an unlikely strategy. We're about to take up an offering in just a few minutes to change the world. Listen, that's just how God works. I can't apologize for it. It's just what he does. All I'm trying to do is point out the truth for your life. 
when, when we invest in the kingdom, when we begin to live our lives according to God, he multiplies us. He multiplies what we're doing. Uh, um, Proverbs, I've forgotten a verse. Listen to this in the message. All right, Proverbs 11, 24 and 25. This is the message. It's, it's a, a paraphrase. It says this. The world of the generous gets larger and larger. The world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. That's a biblical principle, y'all. When you're generous, when you begin to live the way that God wants you to live, generosity is, is, is the goal that we're trying to get to as a people. When we live a generous life, not just giving an offering to the church, I'm talking about outside of the four walls here. When we begin to love people giving them, investing our time, our talent, our treasure, and our tongue in the lives of others, our world gets larger. The kingdom of God advances. We get to usher enemies of God into the presence of God, and they magically, miraculously turn into children of God. It is amazing what God can do through us when we follow God's plan. Listen, I believe that God wants to do a miracle through the church at Lake Forest. And the reason I believe that is because I believe that God still goes to unlikely places. He still uses unlikely people and unlikely strategies to get to unlikely outcomes. He did it thousands of years ago. He did it around the time that I was born. And I think he'll continue to do it long after I am gone. It's an unlikely place. We're all unlikely people. What I'm asking you in this series as we come together as a family, is to believe God for the future and to start today with a miracle in our hearts preparing for the miracle that is coming one day.